Hey there guys and welcome to Kick Scammers, the show where we look at the terrible, scammy, unbelievable and downright crazy Kickstarters, Indiegogos and GoFundMes to ever grace the world of crowdfunding. Over the years I've covered well over 200 campaigns whilst working on this show and whilst I continue to pump out bigger and badder content in the background I wanted to collect together another list of five of the absolute worst campaigns that ended in the worst possible way. The Fatal Way. Yep, it's time. For now, that's what I call kick scammers once again, as we look at five examples of things going wrong. Going terribly, terribly wrong. Not just for the backers, but more importantly for this episode, the campaign owners in this Kickstarter's Fatal Campaigns. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. This is Melissa. And you know what Melissa likes? She likes cats. No, 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 not like you and me like cats. I mean, she really likes cats. This woman is obsessed. You know Eleanor Abernathy, aka the crazy cat lady from The Simpsons? Well, this is her in real life. I love animals, I have my whole life. I speak up for them, I am their voice. Okay. As you would have no doubt already predicted, Melissa had quite the collection of cats herself, around about 50 of them in fact. But she didn't stop there, because she also ran an illegal cat rescue centre out of her own home. Now if you're like me, you probably don't know exactly what makes a cat rescue centre illegal and in a video like this, your mind is probably racing. Well, it's not that horrific to be fair. She wasn't profiting from helping these cats, in fact I'm sure she did help out plenty of them. What makes this non-profit organisation illegal though is the fact that she hasn't registered it as an official charity, but was still aiming to get as much money as she possibly could via donations and crowdfunding. Which brings us to the first local fundraiser, which sadly I don't have much information on. However, it was for only $500 to pay off the fees needed to become an officially registered charity. Whether this got funded or not, sadly I can't prove, but regardless, she never did fill in the forms anyway and continued to run her operation her way, constantly starting up crowdfunding campaigns which all failed. And on top of this, literally begging for money non-stop on her own Facebook page as she refused to turn down any cat that came her way. Now just to paint even more of a picture for you, as this woman became more and more obsessed with her cats, they were constantly filling up her family's home. As you would expect, the house was becoming pretty damn filthy, and on top of that, Melissa was a bit of a hoarder too. Oh yes, she also enjoyed the occasional prescription medication binge too. Now to get to the part that you were waiting for. I'm sure your mind is trying to figure out what the big twist is here. Is it the cats? Did they die? Well, yes, some of them did, but according to reports, that's quite common during kitten season, as big litters don't always make it. Especially in circumstances like these. Nope, the big twist here is actually quite a bit worse, as it actually involves her husband, Frank. And this is Frank. Everybody say hi to Frank. Back in February of 2007, Frank here went missing and Melissa reported this to the police. Look, she even posted up an image of him on her Facebook, which up to this point only ever had pictures of, you guessed it, her cats. My husband wouldn't hurt anyone. He was generous, he was nice, he was nice to everyone he met. Police came along and gave a little search of their horrific looking home and besides a crowbarred open safe which she claims was done by robbers that she forgot to report, the police got suspicious so they got a warrant to thoroughly search the premises which is when they found blood deep in the bed and blood on the ceiling. His body was also found shortly after about 20 miles away in his own car. Frank was murdered two gunshots to the head. 
With the evidence against her, Melissa admitted that her and pretty much the only family member that would stay in contact with her, her own son, worked together to commit the crime with him doing the shooting and her doing the cleaning. And obviously, they both ended up in prison. And that was the tragic end of that. But then, two years later, she sent a letter to the judge from her jail cell confirming that she was in fact the only killer and it had nothing to do with her son, who she had framed for the murder. She did it all alone. <laughs> God damn, what an evil but super caring for cats lass. Even though she lived in absolute squalor and most people that knew her hated her, her cats for the most part were found to actually be in good shape. No thanks to the multiple crowdfunding campaigns that she attempted to start, most of which are completely hidden nowadays after the trial, so there's no way of knowing how many she actually started, but she obviously didn't know what she was doing, and the obsessive hoarder and drug-taking ways didn't help in any way, shape or form. Remember the broken into safe? Yeah? Well, that was done by her to get into her husband's hidden medication. Turns out that this whole situation was just getting way too much for him. He was sleeping on the sofa, his house was getting completely destroyed by the cats, and he tried to end it all with her via divorce, and well, I'm sure you can work out the rest. A pretty horrific tale, I'm sure you'll all agree, and the sort of tale that's so crazy and twisted that you just can't make it up even if you tried. Oh yeah, there is one more thing. Frank was also an imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and Melissa was a member too. It's a crazy world we live in, guys. This is Christopher Dennis. It's 2004 and he's in his bathroom as he is every morning dressing up as Superman in his small studio basement apartment just like he does every single day, seven days a week. It's early, the sun is beaming down in an extremely hot Hollywood Boulevard and for anybody that has ever visited this particular street in LA, you know, the one with all the stars on the floor, well, you will know exactly what he's up to. He's making his way to the front of the incredibly popular Hollywood theatre to do this. Hi there, welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> Give me your hand. <laughs> Get this shot. Now, you want me to lift you? No. Okay, I'm gonna lift you. There you go. Yep. Christopher Dennis loves Superman so much that every single day he dresses up as Superman, goes to Hollywood and takes pictures with tourists for tips. Where many colourful characters do the same and do it for the money, Christopher was so obsessed with the character of Superman that he used this platform in a way to bring joy to as many individuals as possible. But with that said, he sure didn't have any worries about constantly reminding people that he worked for tips. Mr. Man, we do work on tips, okay? Do you guys want a picture? All right, we do work on tips, okay? Uh, it's tips, it's whatever you like. However you look at it, for Christopher, the most important part was staying true to the Superman character. So how did this all start? Well, back when you could actually walk down Hollywood Boulevard without being stopped by Elmo, Jack Sparrow, Freddy Krueger, and, well, whoever this is, you had nobody stopping you. Christopher Dennis himself, who just like most of these guys was a struggling actor working a dead end job in between an inconsistent lifestyle of auditions, this boring lifeless job was actually in a restaurant waiting tables by the way, and it was here when he remembered back to plenty of auditions being constantly compared to Christopher Reeve, as well as the customers of the restaurant making the same comparison. Besides his then strawberry blonde hair, he definitely looked the part. And at one particular audition, someone even suggested that he dye his hair black to become even more of a lookalike to the Man of Steel, which he did, and for him, the resemblance was uncanny. 
In desperate need of a more flexible timetable, he decided to try out walking the streets and taking pictures with tourists, but as he was the first person to do it, he got stage fright and went home to reevaluate his options. He tried one more time before giving it all up the next day, and boom, $1,000 in a single day. This obviously led to a profession that is now swamped and the possibility of gaining that sort of money again is simply unachievable. In fact, according to reports, the majority of the people that dress up and take pictures with tourists outside the Hollywood theatre are actually homeless themselves and barely make enough money to eat. Regardless, for the next 25 years, Christopher Dennis became the Superman of Hollywood Boulevard. Now, all of this leads us down a path of the very first documentary based on his life in 2007 called Confessions of a Superhero. The documentary tells a good story about a few years leading up to 2007, all about the life of Christopher Dennis, who obviously plays Superman, Jennifer Gert, who portrays Wonder Woman, Maximus Allen, who dresses up as Batman, and Joe McQueen, who's inside that Hulk outfit. It's a pretty sad documentary that really does shine a light on the cutthroat world of desperately trying to be cast in any kind of role. The competition was fierce and the dressing up and taking pics for money game also became oversaturated with desperate artists all trying to be seen. However, for this episode of Kick Scammers, the main focus is really on Chris himself as we get to see just how obsessed he was with the lifestyle that he carved for himself. Not only did he play the role of Superman on the strip for 20 plus years, but after discovering that Metropolis, Illinois, actually existed, and they actually held a yearly Superman event, he took it upon himself to start collecting memorabilia until it took over his entire living space. This is where Christopher Dennis lives, constantly adding to his collection, dressing up as Superman himself constantly it seems, and creating dioramas of his favourite scenes. He married his eventual wife at one of these conventions, and well, honestly, not a lot else happened besides all the typical stuff you would expect from a rather glum documentary about four struggling artists ending in a way that makes you think that this is probably the life that they will continue to lead for the remainder of their lives. However, for Chris, it just got worse after the documentary ended and the credits rolled. For many, the first real update on anything to do with Christopher Dennis came in the form of two GoFundMes. You had Help Hollywood Superman and Saving Superman. And sadly, that update wasn't too good. Christopher Dennis had become homeless, and whilst on the street, he was beaten with golf clubs until he lost several teeth and his remaining possessions were stolen from him, including $900, a laptop, a phone, and his Superman outfit. Without his costume, his world was turned upside down, and the small $1,000 campaign shot past their goal with well wishes who had been in the company of Hollywood Superman over the last 25 years. New story picked up the tragic event and it seemed that life was getting back on track for the Hollywood Superman and where did the money go? Well, that can actually be seen in his second crowdfunding attempt, this time on Kickstarter, where he attempted to create an online documentary series talking about his life. This one asked for $5,500 for the first episode and it too obliterated its goals, leading us to another campaign, this time on Indiegogo for a second episode in the web documentary series. And this one, well actually this one didn't hit its goal, in fact it did pretty badly with its funding. So this first episode in this mini documentary. There are reports that I have seen of the first episode being finished to some degree at least but it's been taken down from its private link on Vimeo and is no longer available online anywhere from what I can tell. Was this even a link to the documentary or was it simply just an update on what was going on? I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt as plenty of footage and pictures I found online showcase that he did indeed work on the project. It's just hard to find out exactly how far they got with it. Regardless, endless amounts of comments on the Kickstarter show that not only did backers not see the final product, but it seems that everybody that pledged towards the campaign also didn't get any rewards that Christopher Dennis promised to send out. Why was this? 
Well, even though the trailer for the campaign showed us the life of an underdog street performer down and out on his luck, finally on the path of full recovery with new teeth, a new costume and this documentary series itself, the truth is, behind the scenes, it wasn't the triumphant return that we were seeing because two years later, we got to see the final campaign. November 13th, 2019 was the day that this GoFundMe showed up. Funeral service for Hollywood Boulevard Superman. Yep, he died. TMZ broke the news a few days before with the title Hollywood Boulevard Impersonator Dead at 52, Body Found in a Clothing Bin. And guys, before going ahead, the rest of the video from here on out gets seriously depressing. So what actually happened? Well, Christopher Dennis was depressed, severely depressed, and you could see why. He was a struggling actor, desperate to follow in the footsteps of Oscar-winning Sandy Dennis, who he claimed was his mother, despite family denying this, and quite simply, he didn't achieve that goal. His wife that he married in the Confessions of a Superhero movie not only left him, but according to Dennis, even tried to convince him to buy a gun so she could kill them both. On top of this, the street performing as famous characters outside the Hollywood theatre thing had blown up to the point that it was impossible to earn any kind of a living doing it. I already stated that he was homeless, but according to reports, this was actually quite a regular occurrence that happened multiple times, including being evicted from his property, which he claims was done out of the blue with his entire Superman collection being dumped at the side of the road, and most of which being taken away. And finally, it's also been stated a few times in earlier documentaries that he did indeed battle with alcohol and drug addiction. And looking into his life leading up to this tragic point, it seems that the battle was far from over. This pushed him down the path of homelessness again several times, which led to an incident of him getting mugged and his super suit being stolen. Although, just to be clear guys, this offence is actually up for debate, and many street performers claim that this was actually all down to drug abuse, primarily smoking crystal meth that actually put him in this situation instead, and that the mugging just never happened. And this is the biggest problem with researching Christopher Dennis. Los Angeles Times report reporter Nita Lellyfield actually decided to get more info about his life in a sort of send-off editorial piece, which was when she discovered quite a different story than what had been portrayed during his life. The reporter paints a picture of what it was like talking to tens or possibly even hundreds of costumed characters, all claiming that this job was what they did in between their real acting jobs that they more frequently did, when in reality, this is their life. She explains this way of thinking primarily to showcase to the reader that depending on who she is speaking to, the blurred backstory of what actually happened and what really was going on in Christopher's life can jumble about quite a bit. They're pretty much all in agreement that Christopher's life did in fact start spiralling out of control after he split with his wife. However, what was up for debate was why he split with her. Was it his drug use, which he definitely did suffer from, or was it the fact that she made him choose between her? and Superman. He was ordered to go to drug rehabilitation centres to get off the crystal meth whilst living in an extremely run-down RV, before that was also taken away by the state, making him homeless again. And this was when he met his new girlfriend, Jennifer, who according to interviews actually stated that he was finally starting to kick the drug habit. With the taking tips for Pick's game not pulling in as much money as before, he had come up with a new money-making scheme which involved him using his girlfriend's wheelchair to climb up to the top of a donation bin and to use a homemade tool to pull out the items to either wear or to sell. One night, instead of taking his girlfriend with him, like he normally would as she would hold the chair in place for him to do this, this, he told her to stay put in bed, he could do it alone. She did, and when she woke up realising he wasn't in bed with her, she got the help of a few friends to hobble towards the clothes bins, where she found that he had fallen headfirst down a chute, breaking his neck. 
It was later reported that he was high on meth when this incident happened. According to the same Los Angeles Times article, Jennifer explains that the duo were waiting on a housing voucher so that they could move in together and that Christopher had plans on returning as Superman. We were this close, she explained. And the sad thing about all of this is that she never ever got to see him in a Superman suit. Because by the time that she met him, there was no suit in sight. In fact, the next time he was seen in a suit was at his funeral. So, it's been reported several times by people that knew him that the money raised that he could actually get his hands on at least, sadly went on drugs instead. As stated, the mugging story is up for debate too, and the campaigns themselves yielded no results for any of the backers. So, you know what, form your own opinion. The people that put money into these things thought they were doing the right thing, but sadly, if what is reported on is true, then they led him down a path of torment as the majority of the money raised was used in the worst way possible. The Hollywood Superman spent his life chasing a dream that sadly he wasn't able to achieve. However, what he was able to do was spread joy to tens of thousands of tourists by closely following the characteristics of his idol. Some people look at these campaigns as scams and, you know, to be fair, they're not wrong. The money was definitely mistreated and nobody got their rewards. But I feel that the intentions were at least here in the beginning. Again, judge for yourself. That's what the comment section is for. However, before looking at my comment section, perhaps you should check out the final GoFundMe's comment section filled to the brim with well wishes from people that interacted with Christopher, whether it was to simply take a photo or because he helped a local shop recover stolen items. There's no denying that this guy made a serious impact recreating his version of the iconic character. And during his heyday at least, fully embrace what it means to be Superman. Hey there guys, I hope you are mm, enjoying the video. I just want to give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and YouTube members that help me make videos like this every single week. If you guys want to support the show and see several upcoming Kickscam episodes before they go public, including the Peter Molyneux Kickstarter disaster, Kickstarter's dumbest scam, Jasmine Tridevil's bizarre GoFundMe will be ready within the next week, and the Paprium scandal is already available, and I am also working on a cryptocurrency episode too. Like I said, if you want to support the show for as little as you wish, you can do so on Patreon or as a YouTube member and get instant access to all of these episodes before they go public. Anyway, let's carry on with the video. Helping pay for somebody's funeral is nothing but a normal thing that you're likely to see on GoFundMe. It's a tragedy when a friend or someone you know dies, especially when the family around them do not have the stupidly high funds to respectively put that beloved member of family to rest. And sadly for the Aguilar family, Jared Aguilar died on Christmas morning 2017. To help raise the funds needed for the departure of Jared, one Sean K. Williams set up the GoFundMe page asking for a humble $5,000 and even tagged Sean into a Facebook post to raise awareness from his friends and family. Our dear friend Jared Aguilar passed away tragically earlier this Christmas morning. He was a loyal friend who died doing what he loved. Except, <laughs> you guessed it, he ain't dead. He alive. Jared was very, very much alive, and thankfully, probably due to the tagging over on Facebook, the GoFundMe page quickly got taken down so, so quickly that nobody actually pledged towards the fake funeral costs. And although family members knew the whole thing was bogus, because, well, they spent Christmas with him, a lot of friends didn't. And in several interviews with local news channels, he explains that his phone literally blew up with well wishes and messages of grief. 
Nobody ever worked out who Sean K. Williams was, and after GoFundMe quickly removed the post, they put out a statement that anybody that fell for this would indeed get a full refund. Okay, so here's a fairly recent one for you. Mike Hughes, aka Mad Mike Hughes, originally a limousine driver before working with NASCAR drivers, he was a motorcycle racer and even a stuntman. According to the documentary Rocket Man, which tells the story of Mad Mike Hughes, he was one day watching the Teletubbies, as you do. He fell asleep and dreamt of jumping a limousine, as you do, before he decided to do that very thing, as you do. I've always been very, very interested in individuals and the way that they choose to live their lives, which is why I create videos like these ones. And Mad Mike Hughes is without a doubt one of the more interesting people that I've come across. A very religious individual, obsessed with his cats and even more interested in his fascination with rockets. Now obviously Mike was a very technical guy beforehand, but at the same time he pretty much became a self-taught rocket scientist off his own back, which resulted in attempt number one. Yep, Mike is in this rocket, apparently. To be fair, there is a little bit of skepticism here about this, as from what I've read online, no footage of him actually entering the rocket itself actually exists, but hey, the way I see it, conspiracy theorists have got to theorise over something, am I right? Whatever you believe, I'm going to say that yes, he was in the rocket, the rocket that tore up its parachute and crashed down a tad too hard, which resulted in him not being able to recover properly for about two weeks. Now. The real question here is, why? Why did Mad Mike Hughes decide to climb into a homemade rocket that was quite literally built from scraps? Well, besides the whole mad part of his name, of course. And if you expected me to say something along the lines of Flat Earth, I will. Just not yet. Oh, hello, I'm Mad Mike Hughes and I'm in my living room here in Apple Valley, California. This video is to start an actually Kickstarter Kickstarter campaign and explain what this is all about and to make history and make an exclusive event just for the people on Kickstarter. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to break my record of uh, 1,374 foot, which is the longest jump in Daredevil history, which I set in January of 2014 in, in Arizona. So what we're trying to do is jump over half a mile with my steam rocket. And I am the only person that's done this since Evil Knievel attempted it 41 years ago. You see, this was the first campaign, Mission Rocket Stage 1, the one mile manned rocket jump. The idea is to perform the jump and to make it a bit of an event. He wants to get the rocket over half a mile and with music as well as t-shirts and what have you, this second jump will fund that record breaking attempt. The only problem was that the Kickstarter failed and it failed hard. This failed Kickstarter didn't stop him though, as he still went ahead with creating his rocket and it was actually the Flat Earth community that helped him do it. It's not known exactly when, but Mike became a pretty big Flat Earther during this time and although there are a few people out there that believe he only did this to get the funding, again, I don't believe the theorists. After watching that Rocket Man documentary that I mentioned earlier, he comes across as a chap that is very intelligent at certain things, like building rockets out of scrap metal, but not that good of an actor, and his passion that comes through when he speaks about the Flat Earth community is pretty believable. Anyway, the full length hour and a half documentary, which is pretty good if I'm honest, builds up to the launch which yes, did get successfully funded from a GoFundMe sponsor, and spoiler alert here guys in case you haven't watched it, it didn't work. But then another attempt came in shortly after and it did. Did he prove that the world was indeed flat? Of course he didn't. 
The problem was that his rockets were never going to get him high enough in his eyes to see the curvature of the Earth. For that, he would need $2 million, which is where our third campaign comes into play. And that never hit its funding. And although it shows no backers currently, the documentary did end explaining that his $2 million goal had only reached $65. Which brings us to February 2020, and whilst filming for the Science Channel, Mike went up once again in his homemade rocket, and as you can see, a malfunction came into play straight away, resulting in the parachute coming off and Mike landing full pelt, hitting the ground, which sadly killed him. And that was the end of that. Mike didn't do these crazy jumps because he was a flat earther in the beginning, he did them because of his love of homemade rockets and because of his stuntman past. But still, it was his later beliefs that pushed him down the path to keep pushing further and further and those jumps were at least partially funded by the Flat Earth community. Okay guys, I know this is a bold statement to make, but out of the 18 Kickscammer videos I've made and the 50 plus campaigns found within them, this is easily the most horrific and in all honesty is going to be pretty damn hard to beat. Ken, have a seat my man, even you will be shocked about this one. I warn you before going ahead that this one sadly gets a little bit graphic. Viewer discretion is most definitely advised. It is my great displeasure to show off this self-taught Danish engineer, Peter Madsen. Oh boy. Right, let's start off clean. Peter is a very intelligent man, and in his own words, a maker of extreme machines, who basically used his naval engineering knowledge to, well build a bloody submarine, or to be more specific, a midget submarine, which is essentially a mini submarine that weighs less than 150 tons. Yeah, you can see where this one's going, right? Well, you would be wrong, as he actually bloody did it. In fact, it went so well that he decided to build a space rocket, which also, well, it did okay in the test runs. So a few hiccups aside, everything seemed to be going sort of in the right direction, as Copenhagen Suborbitals, the company partly founded by Peter, launched a couple of campaigns to get this thing going. One succeeded, and one failed. However, the one that failed had that funky, flexible golfing going on, so the company was still able to get away with the funds. The company is run by engineers in their own time, most of which don't get paid. To this day, they seem to be doing pretty good work, and the launch of this rocket has been pushed back to the summer of 2018. In other words, this little organisation is fine. However, the real focus of all of this has to do with Peter. Peter was obsessed with engineering. Not only was he responsible for the launch pad, the launch system, and the booster rocket engines within Copenhagen Suborbital's early days, but in his spare time, he went back and worked on those submarines. Oh yes, submarines. He made three of them. You got the UC-1 Freya, the first ever private Danish submarine. It was successful and had over 500 dives before it was demolished, and in 2008, it sank. But don't laugh, that was always expected. Next up, you got the UC2 Cracker, which was the first diesel electric amateur sub in Denmark. Another successful sub that actually didn't sink and now can be found on display at Denmark's Technical Museum in Helsinger. And finally, you got the UC3 Nautilus, which at the time was the biggest privately built sub in the world. It's done over a thousand dives and was nothing but a success for Peter and his team. But just like all subs, a few years later, it needed a cleanup. Which is when the third Indiegogo campaign was launched. For only 50,000, they wanted to sandblast, paint, and even give a few upgrades to UC3 Nautilus. Sadly, it didn't hit its goal. But yet again, the old flexible goal rears its head and the organization got away with just over $6,000. And ladies and gentlemen, 
This is where the whole thing went seriously tits up. The ownership of the sub became quite a heated debate between Peter and Copenhagen suborbitals, which is why Peter left the organisation taking his sub with him. The whole debacle ended up catching the interest of Swedish journalist Kim Wall, who was invited by Peter to take a trip on the sub with him at around 7pm on August the 10th. Eight hours passed. During the time Kim's partner, Ole Stobb, began to worry as there was no sign of his lady friend or the Nautilus, so he ended up biking around the pier to try and find the submarine. Unable to find anything, he decided to contact the authorities. It was 3.30am when police received the call who sent out helicopters and ships searching for the submarine, and it wasn't until 10.30am when the first sight of the sub was spotted, and surprisingly, everything seemed fine and Pete was seen popping out of the submarine's tower alone. He then went back down underneath the hatch before quickly re-emerging as the submarine began to sink. Peter then quickly jumped out of the vessel and swam to a nearby boat where he was rescued and he returned to land. With all of Peter's hard work on space rocket submarines, he had actually become a little bit of a celebrity in Denmark, and during the search, journalists had heard of the missing sub and was also waiting for him at the dock. You see, according to Peter, the issue was to do with the ballast tank, which apparently holds air and water to vary the sub's buoyancy, whatever that means. Regardless, Peter explained that this ballast tank filled with water, which resulted in the sub suddenly submerging, and as the hatches were open, the three-year-long project was gone in about 30 seconds. If he'd been below deck, he would have been killed. Sadly, the sinking of a homemade submarine isn't the end of this tale, as Peter seemed to forget to mention anything about the reporter on board. When questioned, he said that she was never on board and he dropped her off just before the sub took off. Was he lying? Well, here's a picture of the two of them together on the submarine. Obviously, something was fishy. Nobody could find Kim Wall, so to get to the bottom of this, the sub was rescued from its sunken state as officials expected to find the remains of the journalists. And surprisingly, they didn't find anything. Still, the fuzz didn't believe his story and they ended up arresting him for involuntary manslaughter. For having killed in an unknown way and in an unknown place, Kim Isabel Frederica Wall of Sweden sometime after Thursday at 5 p.m. The very next day, Peter found himself in court where he changed his story. He did not drop her off, but instead she died in the submarine after a hatch fell on her head, which resulted in him panicking, so he dragged her body out of the sub by a rope and buried her at sea. Not long after, a cyclist riding along the island found a woman's torso had swept ashore. Eventually, divers found her legs, her arms, her head, clothing, a saw wrapped in bags, and knives that had been used to stab Kim in a certain area 15 times. Obviously, his charge was changed from involuntary manslaughter to simply manslaughter, and when detectives checked his computer, they found hardcore snuff porn that involved women being strangled, decapitated, and tortured. Regardless of all of this, Peter kept to his story. Mostly. There were the occasional added extra like carbon monoxide poisoning and the admittance of dismemberment. So, where are we now? Well, in court on April the 25th, Judge Annette Burko and her two jurors found Peter Madsen guilty of all three charges. Premeditated murder, aggravated sexual assault, and the desecrating of a corpse. This is a cynical and pre-planned sexual assault of a particularly brutal nature on a random woman who, in connection with her journalistic work, accepted an invitation for a sailing trip on the acute submarine. Peter has now been given life in prison. I don't really need to add anything to this. I feel the same way as you. It's a horrific story that opened up beyond my wildest nightmare. I expected to tell you guys a funny story of a sunken submarine, but instead, 
this crazy tale unfolded itself.